All right, we are. Uh, hold on. Now we're rolling. Oh, that's great. We timed it, everything. Let's go. It's time for the big hats. Welcome in, everybody. He's Jason Ginty. I'm Rod Ryan, and this is episode what? Episode 38. Uh, welcome aboard on the Play Pants podcast at Play Pants Pod on all the different social medias out there. And we're going to talk a little football. Now, we don't know anything about football other than just being fans and super fans, but we got to at least talk a little bit about the devastation in Buffalo right now and that Bill's loss. Jason's dealing with he his coaches out in New Orleans. Sean Payton kind of just rocked everyone by walking out. I'll have to ask him if he knew that was coming. And today, as we record on January 26th, it's a 25-year anniversary of the Green Bay Packers beating the New England Patriots in the Super Bowl. It was 29 years ago. Jason and I were at that game in New Orleans, completely shammered from the weekend. We were partying all weekend long, and we just rolled into that game on fumes. So we got a pretty cool anniversary. We'll talk about that. And, you know, Rod, what's cool is that uh, Andre the Giant uh, would have been, it was his birthday this week. Right? Or no, he died. I didn't, I didn't even read your, Okay, time out. I didn't even read your fucking notes you sent, dude. I'm, I'm, I'm busted. I am cold busted right now. I send this stuff out and you don't look at it? No. You're like the people on my show. I'm telling you, none of these assholes read my emails. What is the deal? I'm being very helpful. I'm sending a whole rundown of the entire show <laughs> and nobody it. reads anything. I, fucking, I, didn't read it. I, I read it. I couldn't remember. I, I'll be In honest. 19... 19- 93, the great Andre the Giant passed away. Uh, heart attack. He was only 46 years old. So it got me thinking about wrestlers. Wrestlers. <laughs> I mean, did you have a moment when you were into wrestling? Everybody did, right? When I was a kid, me and my brother, Saturday mornings, dude. Sat- or it was Saturday, Saturday afternoons, I believe it was. We'd sit around and cartoons would kind of end and you're like, okay, I'll go have lunch. But then the wrestling came on and then we slowly got into it somehow. And then I think my brother got us into it more than I did. And then it became a thing because then you were into it because they, they did those stories that those wrestlers had going like, like you followed the soap opera of it. They were great. And I got I got all roped into it. But then I, I got out of it pretty quick. I was in and out for a couple of years, but uh, we're going to run down our top five. And this was a great idea. Top five favorite wrestlers of all time. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. so bizarre. It's so weird. But I love the fact that it gets us out of our music wheelhouse. Absolutely. Um, okay, well, let's, uh, let's just rip off the Band-Aid. So as the, the way that I look at what just happened uh, over the weekend, Buffalo Bills fans, we live with the phrase wide right, which is the Scott Norwood kick, Super Bowl 25. Jeff Hostetler has a Super Bowl ring and Jim Kelly doesn't. Who? Weird. Um, we lost to the Giants. Uh, Scott Norwood, wide right. Everyone knows the phrase wide right. Keeping with football, there was the Memphis City Miracle. Now, this is this is for my Houston fans here because it's right when the Oilers moved to Tennessee. And some Houston fans do use that as, hey, that was payback for the comeback because we had the comeback with Frank Reich. That was against the Oilers. These Houston peeps do not like me talking about Frank Reich and that comeback game. But there was the Memphis City miracle where it was to get us into the playoffs and it was a fucking forward pass. Yeah, it totally was. But but they it was a special teams play and we got, you know, we got ripped right at the end. So wide right, Memphis miracle, and now 13 seconds. 13 (sighs) seconds is what haunts Bills fans because that's the amount of time that we left Mahomes on the clock for him to march down there to get us into overtime and then ultimately lose the game. So uh, just, I hadn't talked to you about this game at all. I hadn't talked to you about the heartbreak or anything, a few text messages here and there. Um, But it was an amazing game, right? I I think I even texted you at one point, like you, you sent like a, 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 a gif of a guy blowing into a paper bag. Like, Oh my God, I'm hyperventilating. And I'm like, yeah, but what a fucking game. Like, Yes, I wanted the Bills to win that game more than anything, obviously, right? But just what we saw in that game 
like you've seen the meme since it's like, you know, the rest of the games don't matter. This was a Super Bowl. And you even said it in, the, in episode 38. You said that uh, this was going to be the best game. After that, who gives a shit? Because these were the two best teams. Yeah, and you still had Green Bay. You still had number one seeds. I mean, when we were making, when I was making that prediction, I said this is the game. This is the best game. It's a shame that they're both in the AFC because this is really the Super Bowl. I felt it yeah. was the two most talented teams playing each other, and and it ended up being just. And in the last five minutes, you're just like, this is like it's like the uh, it's like a heavyweight fight where they're just trading blows and they're beating the piss out of each other. It's like bam, bam. What's next? What's next? Holy shit. That's got to be the end of the game. Oh my God. There's only a minute left. That's got to be the end of the game. Nope. This has got to be the end of the game. Nope. This has got, and it was like, what the fuck? I didn't even know what I was watching after a while. And my wife is screaming and I'm just sitting there and I'm like, this is the best football game I've ever seen. This has to be one of the greatest all time football games ever played. And yeah, the bills lost and I was bummed out, but I was more bummed out at the fact that the game should still be going right now. You realize if they kept playing, they'd still be playing. Like that's how crazy that game was. You know, it was, it was the best football game that I ever saw up until a week earlier when the bills were almost perfection. Now, again, as far as competition, it was a different kind of game, but what Buffalo did against the Patriots and seven times getting the ball, seven times marching down the field, getting yardage on every play and never punting that was maybe one of the best football games I've ever seen just because it was like watching uh, a, a perfect game by a pitcher right but you're right going back and forth and trading blows back and forth as far as a competitive situation that was the best game um and everyone, you know, was so cool. You know, everybody in my building knows I'm from Buffalo. So we got a sports station down the hall. So these guys are talking to me and, uh, and they all said, they're like, but it was a great game, but it was an unbelievable game. So I went on and I signed the petition for redoing the overtime rules in football. I don't know if, if the petition.com came near you. Um, Josh Allen didn't get a chance to touch the ball in overtime. And and that's a shame for, for if you were a football fan, you didn't call the right coin heads or tails. You didn't call the right flip. And now you don't get to touch the ball and you don't get to play. Think about baseball. Okay. Well, okay. It's the ninth inning. Both teams got a bat still, Yep. you know, it's, it doesn't make sense. I know that they amended overtime, and if they had scored only a field goal, then we would have got the ball. A touchdown doesn't do it. You gotta let you gotta let Josh Allen touch that ball, and that's just for football. I mean, I know that our asses are chapped in Buffalo, but for football, don't you agree or no with the yeah. overtime rule? Well, the overtime rule got changed actually because of the Saints Minnesota Vikings NFC Championship game, where the Saints ended up kicking the the field goal in overtime, and the the Vikings never got a chance to touch the ball. So then they said, "Well, okay, the field goal thing's kind of weak." So then they changed it to like each team, if no one scores, the other team gets the ball. If someone scores a field goal, the other team gets the ball. They score a touchdown, fuck the other team. End of the that, game. That's the end of the game. And and I was literally talking to my son who's thirteen today, and he goes. Why don't they just play another 15 minutes? I go, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And then go to go give them another halftime after 15 minutes if they're still tied. Give them 15 minutes, play another whole quarter, same rules, you know? And I'm like, that seems to make sense to me, you know? I, I, games are long. I, I, you know, can you start both teams on the 20-yard line? Give them a fresh set of downs and say, do what you got to do with it, you know? I don't know. I, I don't know. I uh, I think it's good for football to change the rule specifically because of what happened. Josh Allen was amazing and he didn't even get a chance to show in overtime that he could continue to be amazing. Who knows? They might've gone four and out and then that was it. But for Josh Allen to sit there, the only mistake of the game was not calling heads or tails. <laughs> that, that, sucks. that sucks. I mean, that absolutely sucks. So like, you know, you but, said that the baseball, they get a, they get a chance. Hockey keeps going, you know, soccer, soccer's weird. It just keeps playing, you know, but it's like, you don't do, you don't do a 10th inning and then, oh, well, you know, you're up to bat. 
sure you got to you still baseball is defense you got to pitch you got to field you got to keep them away from home plate but the other team is still going to get a chance to go and bat i'd say just give another quarter give another quarter and after that then give them the 20 yard line it's the playoffs do it in the playoffs like that because it's a it's a winner goes home or win or go home loser goes home give them a whole other quarter you know and and I don't hear like, well, it's, you know, professional athletes, they play a lot. They hit each other. Look at hockey. Those guys play them twice the many games. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, so They're let it rip. Add another quarter. They're not because everything now about the game is to speed up the game. Okay. Right. Everything about it. So they're not, they're definitely not tacking on a whole nother quarter. I know that. Will they seriously take a look? You know, the people that make up the rules for the NFL, they're football fans. They had to want Josh Allen to touch that ball. Oh, I, I yes. get it. In Kansas City, you didn't want him to touch the ball, and we certainly did in Buffalo. But I, I'm outside of those two markets, the world wanted Josh Allen to touch the ball afterwards, just to see can these heavyweights go back and fat, back and forth. So I, I think, I think most people. You can't say everybody. I do think most people. Uh, obviously, we could talk two hours about that game. I, I had two things that I wanted to mention about it. Uh, back in the day, Jason and I, our era, uh, our heyday is obviously going to be the Jim Kelly era. You know, I, I was into the bills long before in the Joe Ferguson days, but Jim Kelly was our Messiah. Okay. Jim Kelly with all the screwing around that he did coming out of college, flat out saying, I don't want to go to Buffalo, went to the USFL and then Houston gamblers. He's here. Right. And he's just rewriting all of the passing records, even though it was a different league, Jim Kelly does not throw a football as a Buffalo bill until he's 26 years old, 26 and beyond 11 seasons later, all that greatness came from Jim Kelly, 26. Josh Allen is 25. Now they're two different guys, but maybe we haven't even seen the best of Josh Allen yet. And you need coaching and you need all the other players. You need all of that. But Josh isn't as old as when Jim Kelly got started. That's awesome. awesome. I mean, that's amazing. That's really cool. You know, I was talking this morning again to my kid and, and, you know, he's not super crazy football fan, but he's like, he goes, man, he goes, it would have been great to see more of that game. Keep going. And that's why he suggested a whole other quarter. He's like, I just wanted to see that keep going. Cause Mahomes, whether you, you know, as a bills fan, you don't want to see him do well. But you couldn't take your eyes off of him either. So it was such a great moment for the NFL overall. And I said, look, man, the future is really bright for the NFL. Because, you know, for a few years, remember, it was like, oh, shit, you know, Brady's old, Breeze is retired, Manning's retired. And you're like, yeah. who's next? Rodgers is old, you know. Well, now you look at Joe Burrow in Cincinnati. You look at Allen in Buffalo. You look at Mahomes. You look at the dude, uh, Hebert, in uh, San Diego. And there's a few other dudes. It's like, oh, shit, the NFL – is looking badass all of a sudden again. And I think we're going to go through another resurgent of uh, it, it being great. And there's going to be a lot of these kinds, kinds of games in the future. Cause you just kind of see the way it's going. And I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm here or there, but I found myself watching a lot more football this past season. Cause it was almost better this year. I felt. Overall. Tom Brady, Tom Brady and Manning. Those two guys were the dudes forever, you know, yeah. and then there was everybody else. There were great players. Drew Brees, like you said, hall of famer, but he just wasn't that marquee. He mm-hmm. just wasn't those two dudes. And what we're seeing, I think is Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes. I really do. Yeah. Um, you know, because they're young. They're going to be, they're going to be playing for 10 more years. Yeah. 10 more years, if they can stay healthy and stay good, then we're in for some great football. And the other thing that I wanted to mention was about Kansas City. Most people know Bill's Mafia and, you know, these idiots that are jumping through tables and drinking and just, you know, being these crazy wild fans. But there's this amazing charitable uh, side to the Bills Mafia. And when uh, Josh Allen's grandmother passed away, uh, people donated in $17 increments for Josh's number. They donated. And I, I don't know how many millions of dollars that they raised, but Josh Allen's grandmother has a wing uh, named after her, a hospital there. And that's just a way of Buffalo saying, Josh, we appreciate you. We want you around. This is what kind of city you live in now. Josh Allen will be connected to that city forever. 
Andy Dalton got the Bills in the playoffs a couple of years ago when he was the quarterback for Cincinnati Bengals. And they found the Bills Mafia found Andy Dalton's charity. And then the day after the Bengals, whatever they did to eliminate the team, we needed help to get into the playoffs. So they knocked somebody off, which got us in to got to so we could back our asses into the playoffs. So Bills Mafia started donating money to Andy Dalton's charity, and Andy Dalton could not believe it. He That's absolutely awesome. he had to come to Buffalo to play us. And he wants to win, but they announced his name. You don't ever announce names. You don't bring out a player from another team. They announced Andy Dalton coming out of the tunnel, thanking him for getting Buffalo in the playoffs for the first time in 20 years. Andy Dalton could not believe the generosity, the amount of money that they raised in his number to his pet charity. So Kansas City kind of took a page out of that playbook and I've heard conflicting reports. I'm going to stick with $13 in $13 increments because of the 13 seconds, um, $178,000 donated to Buffalo children's hospital in to the Josh Allen grandmother wing. And I thought that was an unbelievably classy move. I know they were generating money for something else, but then they got the idea, hey, let's turn this around and let's show the Bills fans that, you know, we appreciated them. We appreciated Josh and everything that everybody did. $178,000 raised from Kansas City. That's the kind of stuff you don't ever forget, okay? Come game day, we'll be rivals again. But, boy, that was classy. And, and what's great about it is it, it, it's, you know, it, at the end of the day, yeah, it's a game. It's their profession. We're all fans. We all wanted the Bills to win if you're a Bills fan. But – this kind of stuff has way more meaning. You know, that's a, that's a hundred some odd thousand dollars. That's going to help a bunch of kids that are going through serious problems. Yeah. Bam. That's amazing. You know, you hope that that kind of thing now that it's kind of happened a few times, maybe we'll see more of this type of thing. Cause these, you know, that's pretty badass. in 13 bucks. You're like, ah, 13 bucks. What's that one beer at the game? Cool. Yeah. I'll sacrifice a beer, donate, feel good about myself. And if it all stacks up, holy shit, man, that is that's a freaking amazing thing, you know? I want Bill's Mafia to be known for jumping through tables. I'm, I'm completely comfortable with the outrageousness and oh, yeah. the, the infamous, the infamy of the Bill's Mafia. But to see this side of it and then to see it bleed over to other, um, to other markets, other teams, other fan bases, um, that's pretty powerful. I mean, that's pretty powerful. And the other thing I'll say is, you know, the world now know who, knows who Josh Allen is. He's, you know, he plays in one of the smallest markets in the NFL. You know, Buffalo is just a small place and it doesn't, it's not, uh, it's, there's not a lot of Hollywood about Buffalo. You know, it's not New York. It's not the coast. It's, it's just a small place and you can kind of get lost there. But I'll tell you right now, the world knows who Josh Allen is. And uh, and we're gonna get Kansas City. We're gonna we'll figure yeah. it out. Yeah, yeah, no, no, the Bills are not going anywhere, man. They're they're gonna be good for a while, and that's gonna be fun. That's gonna be, it, it, you know, I think we all kind of, well, not we all, you and I, really thought we were at least going to show up in the Super Bowl this year. You know, I really had that feeling. I was like, oh, we're gonna make it. Win it? I don't know, but we're gonna make it. Looking at what we have left, it's Kansas City winning the Super Bowl. There's that's that. If, if it was the Bills, yeah. it would have been the Bills winning the Super Bowl. I don't see anyone else standing in either one of those teams' way, the way they played the other night. Like that, those were steamrollers. There's nobody yeah. getting in front of them. There's nobody. It, but then again, any given Sunday, right, Rod? Any given Sunday. Now, um, how blown away <laughs> were you at the news of Sean Payton stepping down? Did, um, you, did you have any idea? I didn't. There, the last week, there's been like, you know, it starts off with, well, Sean Payton uh, can't be reached. He's on vacation. Or, you know, it starts off real slow. You know, the, 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 the leaks start to come out. And I'm like, wow. And as soon as I started hearing, I'm like, dude's been here a long ass time. Last season kind of sucked. We went through like five quarterbacks and stuff. And I'm like, he, you know what? He might just, he might just say, suck it for a couple of years. And then, but then I started thinking, well, wait a minute, if he's going to say suck it, why wouldn't he have done it right after the last game so that our team would have time to go find a new coach? Well, was he waiting? Was he waiting? If, if the saints are getting Aaron Rodgers, I know it's a long shot, 
Sean Payton's not leaving, right? You're getting Aaron Rodgers. You're going to get the, the MVP of the league, right. who I think still has a couple miles left on him. I Absolutely. think he's got three. I think he's got three really good years left in him. In Sean Payton's system? Absolutely. Totally. So this is why I don't think now Aaron Rodgers is going to the Saints because there's no way Sean's leaving if he's getting the MVP of the league coming Correct. over to him. Yeah. So that kind of ruined it for me. As soon as Sean Payton said he was quitting, I said, damn it, because I want the Saints to get Aaron Rodgers. I really do. Because he's not going to come here. I would love for him to play for the Texans. He wants to go somewhere. I think the Saints, he could go in and plug and play. And I think you could do a couple of things and you could really contend. Um, the, the Texans, he, he doesn't want to rebuild his own team, let alone come here and rebuild this mess. So I know we're not going to get him. So I really, in my heart of hearts, dude, I thought you were going to get him in New Orleans. And I would have been so happy and I would have been his number one fan. Yeah, it would have been interesting to get him because he could have stepped in. You know, our defense is great. And then you throw in a couple of receivers, tune up a few things on offense, and man, you're rolling again. You're back. You're 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 in the playoffs next year. You get Guaranteed. guys when Aaron Rodgers comes on board. You get guys that you couldn't get. Yep. <laughs> so that, it makes it just like Tom Brady. Man, they got people over there that played. They didn't know. I mean, they they had their choice of who they wanted, and at a discount, people will come and play because they know that you know Tom Brady's gonna and he did take him to the Super Bowl. Um, that was my first thought. I was really bummed out. I was, I mean, I like Sean Payton. He's obviously going to be a deity there because he brought a, a championship to the city. So, but my first thought was there's no way Aaron Rodgers is going there now. Uh, Shit. I doubt it. I doubt it. I, you know, the only thing I can think of is, you know, if you're going to get rid of your coach, you want to do it right away or, you know, you're going to quit or retire. You want to do it right after the season. I mean, literally like after your last game, that way you give your, your organization a chance to go find somebody. Cause these guys who are good, who are out there, our offensive coordinators are getting scooped up really fast. Yeah. So my only thought is they're just going to move our defensive coordinator, Dennis Allen to head coach. He's got that wired. He's been a coach before he's got the systems. We got a good offensive coordinator, plug and play. Let's go hire another defensive coordinator and we're on our way. Is that a solution to win a Super Bowl? I have no idea, but maybe that's already the plan and play. And they just are playing it out for media coverage. The thing you got to realize about Sean Payton is sure, won a Super Bowl, which was freaking great. But when he came here, he came here after Hurricane Katrina. Hurricane nobody, Katrina. Nobody wanted to go to New Orleans. Like he said in his press conference, everyone was heading out on the I 10, and I'm driving into a city that's got nothing. He goes, I came to a city where there was nothing. It was my first time head coaching. It was, I'm, I'm super young. I don't know shit. You know what I mean? Like I, I know how to coach, but I got to go to this brand new city. And he said, he just hunkered down. And at first it was all about like football, football, football. But then as he started to realize, holy shit, this football means so much more right now. Cause this is the one time, like the whole city was busy every day, cleaning out refrigerators, fixing roofs, helping your neighbors, rebuild houses. And you just worked your balls off every day constantly. But when the saints played, everyone took a break. <laughs> you sat down, you were sitting on like, you know, construction materials in someone's backyard, listening to the radio, or you're looking at some shitty little TV uh, on the side of a, you know, of a barn or whatever the hell the situation was. And you watched the Saints game and it meant so much more. And he had such a great way of building a great culture with the team that it spilled over to the city. The city was like, whoa, you know what? The Saints are playing together as a team. And they really were. You could see it. Didn't matter who you were on that team, you were together. So the community rallied around it so quickly. And I think I even said it on the air today, I said that. Yeah, New Orleans was going to recover from Hurricane Katrina. No doubt it was going to happen. But I think what Sean Payton did, leading the charge with the Saints and the Saints organization, what they did, made it a little bit softer, easier to take. You know, it really helped sure. rally the of troops. It was healing. inspiring. I mean, all that stuff. It's healing. It's some sort of normalcy. There's the Saints. Okay, my fucking house, there's still no roof on it, but man, right. the Saints are playing and it gives you a, a just like all you see all everybody's seen all this stuff, you know, it gives you four hours, take your mind off of things and watch the Saints. And and, and the Saints were good right away, you know, and, and getting Drew Brees and you know, Reggie Bush. And I mean, that was a great time. That was a great time. And those 
Reggie Bush, you know, kind of came and went, but he did some great stuff when he was there. I, I really liked Reggie. He turned me around because I wasn't a huge fan of his coming in, but Sean Payton and Drew Brees, you know, just statues, statues already. You know what I mean? Statues that everybody can agree on that won't be tore down in 20 years or 50 years. Hall of Fame, the second they're eligible, they're in. Um, you know, and, and, and I can remember, I had actually got season tickets. I was a season ticket holder for like four years. And uh, it was great. I mean, it was cool. Sean Payton is a Hall of Fame coach. Yeah, he'll be first for yeah. You know, he won a Super Bowl. He, yeah, I, 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 uh, I think so. You don't win one Super Bowl and get in the Hall of Fame. He, he did more than just. Does everybody Bowl, know that? Like all the sports writers and everything. Again, New Orleans is a small market. We're so yeah, far removed true. from Katrina. I, I don't know that Sean Payton is a Hall of Fame coach. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say I don't think he is. Um, I know what he did. I know what he meant to the city. Drew right. Brees, obviously, he he waltzes in on you know on the yeah. exact you know five years. But I don't know about Sean. That's a good point. That is a good point. You know, I don't I'm know just how sitting. Everyone here, else thinks about him. You know, you think about it, and it's like, well, when Andy Reid retires, he's in. You know, that dude's turned. He, he's done great for two organizations. Um, you know, Andy Reid's in. You know, he started running down coaches and shit. Uh, yeah, maybe not. I don't know. It might take a while. It, it, maybe he won't be in right away. You're right. Cause I'm thinking of it from a new Orleans perspective. I'm not thinking of it from a grand perspective, but you know, I always told people like when I went to the games in the dome, I remember turning to people almost every game going, look, watch Drew Brees. I go, do not take your eyes off of Drew Brees the rest of the game because you're witnessing something that you're probably never going to see again in this building from our own quarterback. You know, you're witnessing something very, very special. You know, and I said, look at this team. I go, Drew Brees is a machine. He's, he's unlike anyone else. I mean, you got your Brady's and your Manning's and all that, but you're watching something super, super special. And Sean Payton as a coach, watch him. He is very, very special at what he does. He's very good at what he does. I'm like, watch it, drink it in, because, man, when these guys leave, we're going to suck, you know? And chances are we're going to. And, it, you know, what? it's okay. It's how things go. You ebb and you flow. You have your peaks and your valleys. And New Orleans has been lucky to ride one hell of a, a, a wave the last, you know, 15 years. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see what happens. But it, it, the city is kind of like, it's like, you know, hey, where's dad going? You know, it's, it's, is he going out for cigarettes and not coming back? What the fuck? Is I this? was blown away. I was completely blown away. But then, like I said, with the Aaron Rodgers thing, then I was kind of really thrown for a loop. Um, 25 years ago, in 1997, Jason and I are now living in New Orleans for three months. Yeah, three months. Green Bay Packers beat the New England Patriots to win their first Super Bowl in like 29 years. The halftime show was the Blues Brothers. It was very, uh, it was a very New Orleans halftime show. Um, Dan Aykroyd, I remember him being in town, and John Goodman, the, the Jim Belushi, that Blues Brothers, um, and ZZ Top came out. James Brown came out, and Jason and I got tickets to the game. We were in New Orleans for about, like I said. Three months. We got there late September. Now it's January, and we go to a Super Bowl, which is freaking cool. Let's not forget how freaking unbelievably lucky, awesome that is. But the reason we got them, Ron, I think you might be getting to that. How did we get those Super Bowl tickets? Which was we, a stroke of genius on your part, by the way. We, I, um, said I'll give you, in, I'll give you credit the, in the deal for coming down there. I think Jason and I were both because we were coming from different cities at the time to go back work together. We worked together in Buffalo, but then he had taken off and he was in Milwaukee. So they're trying to get both of us to come down in new Orleans. And I said, I'm not going without Jason. Jason's not going out without me. And then I tacked on that. If you get me down there, I, I need super bowl tickets. I have to have a pair of super bowl tickets. I mean, I have no leverage at all. All I've ever worked. I've worked for a year and a half in, in Buffalo radio, you know, full time. And here's me, I'm trying to get leverage. Like, okay, you can have all of this uh, in New Orleans if you get me a pair of Super Bowl tickets. But I brokered the deal. I negotiated the deal. I took Dum Dum with me. Um, and when the Super Bowl comes to town, there are parties all over the place. Oh. And I feel like Jason and I went to every single party. 
I mean, every oh, one of them, just with the radio station. It's not like we didn't have any connections yet. It was just through the station. Somehow we weaseled, we greased our way in to all these parties. We partied our asses off all weekend. By the time the game hits, Super Bowl, let's say it's played at around six o'clock or so. We are so whooped from partying, no sleep. We did have to do some promotions. We're doing stuff for Budweiser, Clydesdales. So we're just bouncing from one thing. He's got to be here. I got to be here. We're going from thing to thing, event to event, up on stage. Some guy got a tattoo of the radio station for, for Coca-Cola. What's the craziest thing you would do? I mean, th we were just doing promotions that whole weekend. Yeah. And then hanging out. Oh, there's the bus from, uh, from the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, there was just football players everywhere. Jason and I get to the game. We sit in our seats and we're fucking annihilated. <laughs> okay. We're tired. We're still drunk with a mixture of hangover. I, I mean, we sat there during the game. We stunk. <laughs> from oh, part of it, it was our first Super Bowl. And I was just, I just remember sitting there going, I mean, it was good. It was a great game. You know, Brett Favre, it's kind of historical because you see Brett Favre win his only Super Bowl. Um, it was a great weekend. It was one of my all-time favorite weekends. And it's not lost on me being a small city kid uh, sitting in the Super Bowl. You just thought that that was like, you know, you just thought Microsoft CEOs sat in the stands and that's about, it's, it's about true, but I never thought I'd be at a Super Bowl. And that was amazing. You know what's weird is I think, and if I might not have this right, but I'm pretty sure that's the first game I went to in the Superdome. I don't think I went to a Saints game that year. I don't believe we had tickets. And I, don't uh, remember. I, I think don't the think first so. time I ever stepped foot in the Superdome in New Orleans was for the Super Bowl. And I remember sitting at the game going, when is it over? I just want this to end. I like, like, I can't tell you how many thousands of times I wanted to turn to you and go, dude, can we just fucking leave early? <laughs> <laughs> but I knew you'd fucking punch me so hard that I would still feel it today. And I'm like, it's this, I remember looking around going, okay, drink this shit in, drink it. You're at the super. Bowl. I mean, we're sitting in our seats. We're farting. Oh, We've been partying. I, we stunk. We're laughing. We were laughing so hard. I mean, Jason would, Jason would cut one and I'd sit there like, Oh my God, dude. And you know, you're tight. You're sitting next to people and we're laughing our asses off and we stink. And then I fart. And then Jason starts laughing. And we, it was awful. We couldn't stop <laughs> laughing. The whole Super Bowl, we're dying laughing. I just don't remember partying that hard ever in my life than the Super Bowl weekend. Dude, the people around us were like gagging and stunk so bad. They're like, Jesus Christ. These people paid hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars for these tickets and they're into it. And it's like the greatest day of their lives. And we're just sitting there shitting our pants and fucking laughing like two boys sitting in the back of a classroom. And then we're at the super bowl i cannot and, and i remember when we got the tickets i'm like i'm telling my mom my dad i'm like oh my god i'm going to the super bowl everybody you're going and to they're the like super bowl. no fucking way are you going to the super bowl i was bragging to everybody that we were going to the game i mean I it's just you never thought I, it's just it's just something that's on the other side of the world it's a super bowl you grew up watching it on tv you just don't ever think of you in those seats, you know, and then just being there was just surreal. We didn't give a shit. It's so bad. It was so lost on us. It really I don't think was. we slept. I don't like the night Saturday night into Sunday. I don't think we slept. No, you had to be, you had to be at a remote early in the I, morning on Super Bowl Sunday. I don't think we slept two hours, dude. If I have this wrong, please correct me, but I do believe and this is how fucked up it was is we went because a lot of the parties were put on by alcohols. So we had all these boozes that would advertise on the radio station. So we were kind of, we were at the Miller party. We were at the Bud party. We we're at the freaking, you know, the rum party, the vodka party. And we were just going. And, and they're at the house of blues and Dan Aykroyd's are walking around and Jim oh, Kelly's yeah. walking around. And then Every. there's a party somewhere for Bruce Smith. Cause he's the defensive player of the year or something. I just, it was crazy. And it, it, the booze is just flowing and, and you're just seeing all these rock stars and all these huge NFL players and stuff. And it's just, your head is just spinning. I remember just going, what the fuck? I, I kept waiting to wake up. I kept thinking I was going to wake up and go, oh, that was kind of a cool dream. Weird, but cool. And we don't have selfie cameras. We don't have cell Nothing. phones back then. Nothing. So you don't, you're don't. you not taking pictures with people. You're just, holy shit, there's Howie Long. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it was like that. 
So when we moved to New Orleans, we came in separate and then our, for some reason, and I don't know why, why they thought this, but they rented this apartment in the central business district, not far from St. Charles Avenue. And we called the nine by nine and, and it was furnished and it was an apartment, but like they said, here, you and Rod share this. And we're like, well, what if we were two dudes that didn't know each other? Why is this fair? Why don't we get our own places? But we just like, whatever, who gives a shit? We're happy to be here. So we stayed there. They put us up in there for like a month until we could find a place to rent. Well, we I remember we found a place pretty quick. You know, it only took us like a week and a half or two weeks to find a place. Right. And we well, never gave the keys back to the, to the nine by nine. No. So we just kept the keys. So for the month, anytime we go downtown, we go out, get hammered and then crash there because it was furnished and had everything. And it was great. And there was no Uber or anything Nothing. like that. Nothing. So then. we'd walk, stumble back there and it was a nice building. And I'm not going to say which one it was. But uh, it was great. Well, then, you know, after a month is by, like it was like a month and a week. And it's like, well, let's go see if the keys still work. And they still worked. And the place was still empty. And it's like, well, we'll sleep it off here. And it kept going for, for fucking months. So I remember, it, and I might be wrong here, but I remember that weekend, I'm like, dude, I'm so fucking tired. I got to go pass out. And you're like, we'll see if the key still works. So I did. There was no furniture in the place. They had stripped it. The key worked. We slept on the fucking floor. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, we no, there, slept on the. I remember sleeping on the floor, and then I had to go do a thing with the the Budweiser Clydesdales on a street corner early and, in and the morning. I smelled worse than the horses did. Yes, like it was terrible. So I think we crashed there, went to the game, and just couldn't wait to go home. I couldn't. I couldn't believe it. I was so pissed at myself for like just blowing it out that hard. We got chased by the cops. I stole a banner. Mm, mm, I stole mm. that big Super Bowl banner. That was that, that That was that weekend. That was all part of that Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Because you made a deal with Vince, our boss at the time. You said, because yes. we used to go, it was in the, where, by the Superdome. There used to be a mall right there attached to the Superdome. You'd walk through that, get to the dome. There used to be a food court. So the three of us, like two or three times a week, we'd walk over from the radio station to the food court, eat. And they had all these great, huge Super Bowl banners with the two teams and the logo and all that shit on it throughout the mall. From, they were hanging from the ceiling and they were hanging in the city on all of the <laughs> light poles. You know, they really like decorate the city for the Super Bowl and everything. And my boss, he's like, you know, super sports, our boss, he's super sports guy. And he's like, man, those are so cool, man. He goes, I, you know, I'd like that in my whatever, you know, man cave type of deal. And I said, I'll get you one of those. <laughs> he goes, nah, I don't worry about it. I go, dude, I'll get you one of those. I go, what's it worth, though? He goes, well, what do you want? And I said, I want a month of weekends off. We used to have to work every weekend back then. Yeah. So it's during the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's Saturday. We Wasted. already have tickets. It, we have tickets to the game on Sunday. Dude, so it, no, no, no. It was, it was that morning. It was the morning or like the early afternoon of Super Bowl Sunday. Well, I'm almost positive. Either way. But we're in this mall. There's people everywhere. And mm -hmm. I jump up. Jason causes a diversion on one side of the mall. He he draws in the security guard. I don't know what he did, but <laughs> I don't I, I just told him, I said, dude, listen, I've done this before. Listen, make a ruckus. Make some sort of a ruckus over here. So I don't know what you did, but you drew the security guard off to the side. Then I get up, I grab the banner, and I go, run. And we go running outside, parking lot, everything. And we've got, you know, Paul Blart chasing us. And then they called the cops and everything else. And we're just running, running, running. God. We could have been, you know, I could have been thrown in jail or whatever would have happened to me. And then I wouldn't have never gone to the Super Bowl. But to risk it for a weekend off, and it just added to that. It was just the wildest weekend ever. Just it was insane. And you're walking around. It's all NFL players. So what does NFL players bring? Skirts heels oh my god the the girls uh, that the they're with these football players and then like and there was lines to get into everything i mean there's lines to cruise it and we got these passes we just cruise past the line hey what's up i'm here okay come on in and there's just these lines of these girls in these little skirts and they're hot and they're all dressed up trying to get in and our dumb asses <laughs> come by with our shitty hair and our dumb shirts and our probably shorts and everything else looking like yep. just morons just cruising by hey what's up i'm going in and then just acting like fools. Every time I went to talk to a football player, I'm sure we looked like morons. And it was just a great, 
great weekend. And what has yeah. changed? That was 25 years ago today, God. 1997, that the, the Packers beat the Patriots. Uh, I have since been to three other Super Bowls, and the Patriots have been in all four of them. <laughs> oh, Patriots every stinking time. Every time. Now, that one was pre, that was Drew Bledsoe. Yeah. Uh, in that one. And that was obviously the, the only, um, the only uh, Super Bowl win for Brett Favre, but a uh, pretty historic game. The best part about that Super Bowl, and I, sh I know you watched the documentary, uh, The Four Falls of Buffalo, but one of the wide receivers that went to four Super Bowls with Jim Kelly was Don Beebe. Don Beebe got traded to the Green Bay Packers. And, you know, he, he, he was on the team and Green Bay is about to win the game and they're in victory formation. If you ever look at when the quarterback is going to kneel the ball down, game's over, right? You kneel the ball and that's it. You have the fastest guy on the team about 10 yards back, just in case the worst happens. Somebody swipes at the ball or whatever. You got somebody back there. Don Beebe is that guy. So, Brett Favre kneels, Green Bay wins. It's the only win for Brett Favre in a Super Bowl. He walks back 10 yards, hands the ball to Don Beebe and said, this is for you. Bad. You deserve this. Don Beebe's fifth Super Bowl finally gets a win, and Brett Favre hands him the game ball. Now, he doesn't get the game ball for the team. That's more special. That's the last down of that play. Here you go, Don. This is You've been waiting for this. If you don't love Brett Favre, if you're a Bills fan and you don't love Brett Favre for doing that, then you didn't hear me tell that story or you didn't watch the, the documentary on ESPN. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And Don Beebe's such a cool guy. I remember him telling the story because it was like, oh, shit, I, did, I didn't know that. Of course, I was sitting there shitting my pants in the stands. Rod, I yes, wouldn't have known that. I would not have known that. I just wanted to go home. I didn't care. All right. Um, all right. That's a ton of football talk. And then we're going to pivot to talk about wrestling. The fuck? What is this sports podcast? The put hell? on your sports pants. Uh, put on your singlet because we're going to talk about wrestlers. Uh, Andre the Giant died of a heart attack 29 years ago on this day. Um, so I sent it to Jason and I said, dude, let's do something it. different. Didn't read it. I know you didn't read it. Didn't read it. You're just like the people on my show. Nobody reads shit that I send. Didn't read I it. I really try to be helpful. Yeah, it doesn't work. Um, top five wrestlers, you ready to go after this? <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. This is gonna be weird. This is All gonna right. be wild. Uh, my buddy Briggs was just in New Orleans and he took the Pirates of the Quarter tour with him and his wife and their friends that they brought into New Orleans, and they said they had a great time. So, and again, people are talking about this tour. Pirates of the Quarter, our only sponsor here on the Play Pants podcast. Springtime, closer than you think. It's time to start planning that road trip. So head to New Orleans. Mardi Gras coming up. Take the Pirate Tour when you go to New Orleans, okay? Pirates of the Quarter, five-star rated walking tour of the French Quarter. It's fun. Amazing stories, incredible stories of real historic things that happened right where you're standing, right where you're walking. The whole time you're drinking, you're partying still, and you're in New Orleans. So you're not going to believe what real pilot pirates were able to accomplish in New Orleans. So it's, it's not like, oh, you know what? I don't know if I'm into pirates. You don't have to like pirates. You're just going to hear these great stories. These pirates, the, the stories are so unbelievably cool. Discover pirate history of New Orleans. Visit piratesofthequarter.com. Uh, hit the link wherever you're listening to this podcast at Pirates of the Quarter on all the socials. Okay, Jason, how difficult was this for you? It was weird because when I first saw it and I read it, I, I totally read it. Um, <clears throat> I was like, well, I don't really watch wrestling anymore. I haven't watched wrestling probably since I was like 15. I don't care about it at all doesn't matter sorry raymundo i know he goes to wrestling on monday nights and brings the play pants signs and i do appreciate that uh, but yeah he does i'm telling you what we have a couple guys that are gonna like be interested they're either gonna be interested or just bust their balls that we don't know shit about what we're talking about which is most things 
Well, that's everything on this podcast, which we should name it. We don't know what we're talking about podcast. It might have already been taken. Um, it was weird because I was like, ah, oh, man, I don't fucking, I don't even like wrestling. I don't know much about it. And then I started thinking about it. I'm like, well, wait a minute. And I started rattling off names pretty quick. I'm like, okay, I can do this. I know some dudes. And I started thinking about it more. I'm like, oh, yeah, no. I, I remember at a time in my life for a couple of years, I was into it big time. I was into it a lot. And then big I time. just got out of it because I don't know what happened. I think I just kind of figured it all out and was like, okay, this is really kind of dumb. I started watching wrestling. Jason and I did not know each other when we were young. So how it went down in my house was it was WWF wrestling. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But because of where we live in America is where we were born and raised in America. We're Americans, but we did get Canadian television stations. So you know, we got all these Canadian television stations, same thing with radio stations. And we were so lucky to be exposed to these things. So while the rest of the world, and again, we're not united like the internet is now, you just know that everybody is only getting one hour of wrestling a week, but we got two because we got Maple Leaf wrestling at 10 o'clock, 10 to 11, and then 11 to 12, was WWF and uh, two hours of wrestling in my house in the morning. And it, my mom kind of let us go for a little bit. She did let us watch. She, on Saturday mornings, she wanted you outside. She didn't want you in the house. If you're going to be in the house, you hear that fucking vacuum cleaner. My, your, your mom's going to make you go clean something, you know? What happened was we're watching wrestling. The the coffee table goes to the back of the, of the living room. And then during the commercial breaks, my brother and I would just kill each other. We would watch wrestling and then we would just annihilate each other. And our sister used to watch once in a while too, but my mom's cleaning the house and she's overlooking and she's seeing then, like you said, the hook of wrestling, the storylines, the, um, the soap opera ish of it. My mom started watching it with us, dude. <laughs> My mom no is way. watching wrestling with us now. She's into it. Oh, and then she took me and my dopey friends, loaded us up in the Champagne Supernova, took us to Buffalo, the War Memorial or the, the, uh, the Memorial Auditorium, and we saw wrestling. We what? saw it live. She took us a couple of times to go see wrestling. I saw the Wild Samoans. Oh. I saw Ivan Koloff. I saw Ric Flair. I saw Snooka, Superfly. I saw The Rock's dad. Mm -hmm. The Rock's dad um, was his name early on was Sweet Ebony Diamond. Uh, but then he became Rocky Johnson. And he was my favorite guy. He was my favorite guy when I was a little kid, man. No way. Yeah, I saw him wrestle... Um, Tito, uh, I, I, yeah, I can't remember a lot of them. Bruno San Martini. I mean, old dudes, man, big right. fat guys that used to wrestle. Um, but yeah, so we watched it and I lost my mind over wrestling when I was a little kid. I got out of it. I'll tell you what got me in just a little bit. And it must have been WrestleMania 25, maybe that was here. And somehow I scored tickets and I'm like in row 10 and I could not believe it was the most well-produced after even going to some Super Bowls. It was the most well-produced, slick, unbelievably entertaining thing I'd ever seen in my life. WrestleMania is just, they do it so well. Hmm. They do it up. It's crazy. I didn't get back into wrestling, but I mean, I'm watching, you know, Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. You know, these are guys that are like out of my generation. And I'm watching this and it's just great. It was amazing. I almost wanted to get back into wrestling after seeing it live. No, I, I couldn't do it. I used to watch the same thing. I do the same thing on Saturday. After, you know, you'd watch the cartoons and you have to go clean your room and do some shit, take the garbage out or whatever. And then the, the WWF would come on and my brother and I would watch that shit. I think he, he was into it more than I was. And we used to do the same thing, but you'd sit there and you'd jump, you'd stand. <laughs> my mom's going to fucking kill me because she listens. And We'd stand on the armrest of the couch, right? And you'd be Jimmy Superfly Snooker, and you would oh, jump yeah. off and then land on the couch cushions. 
and you were jumping off of chairs, jumping off the coffee table. And then, you know, my mom would come down and go, what the hell happened down here? Nothing. Nothing. Because you never put everything away. You never rearrange the furniture back the way it was because moms know exactly where it's supposed to go. When you jumped, you had to say, off the top rope. <laughs> Every time. You, were all, you, you, couldn't, you, you couldn't just jump. You had to say, off the top rope. You're not going off the middle <laughs> rope. That's for pussies. That's for little kids. No, no, off the top rope every time, every single time. I remember we, we'd watch and my dad, like it would be on from what? Like noon to one, I think you said, or one to two, something like that. I, in my mind, I remember Maple Leaf Wrestling 10 to 11 and then 11 to 12. It, it was fairly because, early. Because it's got, my mom was not going to let us lay around all afternoon. I mean, right. we just had to get the F out of the house. You're not, you know, you're not doing this. Um, so I feel like we got in and out, but yeah, it was two hours. And I remember like my dad would come home from work or something and we'd be watching me and my brother would be on the floor watching it. And you know, you're doing the moves on your brother and you're doing all this shit. And he'd come in in the middle of a, like the, the, it always seemed like it was always the coolest part of the fight when the guys are beating the shit out of each other. And my dad just was like, he would walk in and he'd go, Oh my God, he's killing him. Oh no, he's really hurting him. Cause he knew it was all fake and he wouldn't my just give a shit. It was my so dad great. could not get into it at all. Like, my, like, I had, he had no, like, let me sit down with the boys and blah, mm -mm, blah, blah. Mm -mm. You know, I got my sister in a deep, deep figure four. Okay. And you break your legs. And she's screaming bloody murder. Not my brother, my sister. And I'm deep. Okay. <laughs> my dad look, comes in, says, stop that, and walks out. <laughs> My sister is screaming like I'm stabbing her. Okay. Oh my God. She's like, this is really, my dad just thought oh, it was all fake. So he didn't know that the figure four that I had on her like was really painful. And my sister is screaming. My dad's thinking that she's just, you know, laying it on heavy. I mean, deep. Yeah. Deep. And my dad just like, stop. And then he just, he had no interest at all. My mom got into it. She started getting into it. It was pretty funny. Every time my dad be like, oh no. He's going to get hurt. Oh, boy, look at that poor man's face. I can hear I, your dad in that deadpan voice. Just deadpan as shit. And that's where I started to go, oh, and it started to turn me a little bit. I was like, then I started seeing it differently. I started started looking at it in a different way, like, oh, that dude was like five feet away from punching that dude, and he fell down. This is bullshit. And then he just started to, then it started to creep in on me too much, and I started looking for it, and then I lost all interest, and I was done. Have you watched, have you seen any of the, there's a series of documentaries, and I'm just the sucker for docs. So have you seen any of the wrestling docs? No. There's, there's, I, there's, I, different, there's different ways to watch them. I mean, I think, I want to say A&E did a series of them, and there's probably like six or eight. Then 30 for 30, which ESPN is real sports, but they did one on Ric Flair. And then there's another one that – is just on its own floating around out there on Andre the Giant. And they're good. I mean, they're really, really good. Well, the, um, remember, the movie The Wrestler, remember that one with uh, The Wrestler? The um, Who's the dude? Jimmy, uh, Mickey Rourke played yes. The Wrestler. And I Great watched movie. that, and I was like, because I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I, I watched wrestling when I was a kid, and then that movie came out a few years ago, and I was like, oh, that's the saddest thing I ever saw. These poor bastards beat the shit out of themselves, and there's nothing left. Yes. There's nothing left at the end of the day. It's awful. And I want to say somebody told me that he was, I'm sure he was inspired by a lot of wrestlers, but I saw a little Jake the Snake in that. And I don't know if, you know, what wrestlers he used as his, you know, because Jake the Snake had the long hair too, but I, I don't know. I'm sure he, he drew influences from a lot of those guys from that old school. But, I mean, they were just mules. I mean, they just were on the road the whole time. These documentaries that they've done on these wrestlers, they're all fascinating. Um, who, who You want to go? Now, these yeah, are our favorite wrestlers. All mine are old. All mine are super old. I'm not into Shawn Michaels and all of that. I don't even know who that is. Shawn Michaels? No. You know who Triple H is? I think I heard of that one. <laughs> Dude, I, I haven't watched wrestling since, like, you know, Hulk Hogan was still badass. I mean, it's been a while. A long, long while. So well, give me your um, top five. We'll, top we'll find five. Out. Don't worry. We'll figure out when was the last time you watched wrestling by you by your this top five. Won't be hard. I promise you'll be like, oh, this is like 80 something. Um, you know who I, I hated but I loved, and now looking back, I really love is uh it, it, and I'll tell you why. The Iron Sheik. 
Remember that dude? He had those crazy curved boots and he was like, what was he Iranian or some shit? Well, and he claimed to be Iranian, sure. He's, he's probably from fucking Chicago or something. And he used the uh, the camel clutch move was his big finishing move. He'd peel your head back and he'd fuck mm-hmm. you up. Yeah, the Iron Sheik. And I, I hated him, but because of those crazy boots, I'm like, he's going to kill somebody with those boots. He you just follow freaked him me on, out. You follow him on Twitter? Yeah, he's messed up and he's funny. He's okay. very dry. So he's very funny. again, it's probably going to be every one of the guys, the guys on your list. There's a documentary on him. Really? And it, it just, it's these young guys that love him. And they said, dude, you got to be on there. So they just, every day he's on Twitter saying, you yeah, know, fuck you. Every t- say something that's in the news. It's like, fuck you, Josh Allen. You should have won, you know, fuck you. Right. 13 right. seconds. He's just, he's, he just F fused to everything. Um, yeah. These guys have wicked backstories. I remember growing up and hating him because I ran and we had, we had hostages and we had things going. It was just a, it was the most horrible place you could be from. And he was gloating about it. And he was telling Americans that we sucked and he was fighting Bob Backlund back then. But that's, but I, I think that. I just recognize how like awful that was, but then how great it was too, because like, holy shit. He, he would load fun. his boot. He would cock his boot. Coo, coo. And yep. it's like, he's cheating. He's yep. fucking cheating every time. I mean, what, what if these refs ever get together after the matches and say, hey, don't turn your back on the Sheiky because he's cocking his boot and he kicks you with that point. I always thought, hey, do they not do like an equipment check before the matches? Because I'm sure those points wouldn't fly. <laughs> those seem pretty illegal to me. <laughs> I am Sheik uh, at five. Great documentary f- on him. Number four. And I love this guy because it was so absurd and it was so weird and he freaked me out in so many different ways. Most of it was because of the amount of body hair he had. George, the animal steel. These are your favorites? Yeah, I love that guy. He would come uh, out and he would bite the turnbuckle and ruin it. And then he'd smash the opponent's face on it because it had no pads. He would eat the padding out of it. Dude, dude green tongue. Brilliant. Brilliant. And he would grunt. Actually, the, the weird thing about it is the guy was like super smart. <laughs> yeah, they was- said he was a teacher or something. And Dude, he, this is a weird list. What's coming up? Wahoo McDaniels? At number three. Wahoo. No, 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 no. I don't even know who that is. I don't even know who that guy is. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. I'm just going to move on. Number three. You already <laughs> talked about this guy earlier. Super Jimmy Superfly Snooker. That's Off right, brother. The top rope. Dude, I remember watching that going, this guy literally can fly. It always looked like he was in the air forever. You know how you watch like Michael Jordan and it seems like he'd leave from the foul line and he'd just be in the air longer than a normal human would. He flew. Super, he, su- he, he flew. Superfly Snooker literally looked like he was flying. Um, and I remember watching him going, this guy's insane. It was just such a cool thing to watch him just jump. I don't know if he ever won or lost, but I just watched watching him jump off the top rope was always the cool thing. Number two, this is, seems pretty easy. It's Hulk Hogan. I've, how do you not love Hulk Hogan? He did the Rocky move every fight. He'd get his ass kicked. He'd start shaking. He'd start looking around. He'd get that weird face, and then he'd come back to life, get all this energy from the crowd, and then he'd win. It was the Rocky move over and over and over again. It's like, how do you not love a, a hero? And he told me, Rodney, to eat my vitamins, and I could, too, be someone like him someday. And you know what? I didn't do that. Because I knew he was taking roids back then. I want to be American hero. Have fun oh. with my family and friends. We play that. We have some old wrestling music's come a long way, kids. Uh, the Absolutely. old Hulk Hogan stuff was really bad. Uh, Hulk Hogan, go ahead. He's not going to be in my top five. I just, I just, I, I just like, the, you know, the all American superhero is what he kind of was for the wrestling world. And, you know, I couldn't. I got sucked in. He did it. He did a great job. He sucked me he in. He was I, the biggest guy in wrestling. He I, was the biggest name. Not the tallest. Not the, He was the biggest dude in wrestling. I mean, and he, does he go down as the biggest dude of all time? I don't know. Probably. And he picked up. Didn't he pick up Andre the Giant and body slam Andre the Giant? Yes. I mean, that's pretty freaking cool. I mean, that solidified. For me, I was like, holy shit. Um, and then God, Hulk Hogan. Number one guy, man. Oh, this is Coco too easy. beware. <laughs> JYD junkyard dog junkyard dog is pretty uh Jim the anvil what is that, that was that one of the guys I don't Jim the anvil Nightheart, sure yeah yeah part yeah, of the yeah. heart foundation no no it wasn't him and Hulk Hogan told this story years ago 
about Andre the Giant, right? How they used to wrestle. These guys all know each other. They're doing this almost on a daily basis, it seems like. So they all know each other. And him and Andre were pretty good friends. And he told this story. It was like the TMZ years ago. You probably saw it. He said that when uh, Andre would get you like uh, kind of in a hold and you have your legs, during the matches, he'd shove his thumb in your ass. <laughs> and he'd call checking it checking oil. your oil. Yeah. yeah. He would check your oil. And I'm like, I remember watching that going, these giant grown ass men are shoving their fingers in each other's asses on TV and we don't see Stinky, it. Stinky, sweaty, huge asses. And I think it's <laughs> the funniest thing I ever heard. So <laughs> like that came out and I had uh, Mark Henry and this is a guy who was huge, huge. He was like a power lifter and he wrestled years later uh, in the early 2000s. And he came into the studio because they were wrestling here in New Orleans. So I got him on the air and I said, dude, and I tell him the story about checking the oil. I go, I go, that's kind of an old eighties thing. Right. And he goes, no, no. He goes, guys are checking oil all the time. And they're still, I'm like, Stop. they still do it. I go, dude. He goes, he goes, I go, if you had your oil checked, I'm asking this monstrous, huge human being. Dude, that, dude is you, a, that dude is a, mo a mountain. Have you ever had your oil checked? He goes, Oh yeah. Yeah. I go, what the f and then I go, have you ever checked someone's oil? And he just starts laughing because, you know, they're in character. No, oh, yeah, I'm badass. He starts laughing. He goes, he goes yeah, you know. <laughs> like, what the fuck? But, it, but they're not. <laughs> I mean, we're men of a certain age here. And, you know, for over 10 years now, I've had my doctor stick his finger in my asshole. And I have a little Indian guy. Okay. I have a little Indian guy. He's got a little hand, little right. brown hand goes in my, it goes in my butthole and that's unpleasant. Okay. A little brown Indian man hand is unpleasant. Andre checking your oil. Mm -hmm. His finger is like a Pringle can. Okay. Oh, it's like a fist. You're getting fisted, can Ron. Can you imagine that going in your butthole? No, no, no. You pay for extra for that some nights. Um, and then number one, dude, I, I this should not be a shock. My favorite wrestler for two reasons. First reason is he was so fucking badass and over the top and so cool. Randy Macho Man Savage was my favorite. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he was great. I loved him then. But then and we're never going to have time to tell this story today, probably. But maybe we will. I don't know. But we ended up spending quite a lot of time with Randy Macho Man Savage uh, years ago during the morning show. And that just took it over the top for me. You know, it was, it blew me out of the water how cool he was. He was a, just a very cool dude to us. And, uh, and, and we'll have to talk about that at some point on this podcast, Rod. So yeah, Macho Man, number one. We will need a separate podcast to talk about Randy Macho Man Savage being the best man of a listener's wedding that we performed on the air. Um, wild. That, that's a whole, that's a whole Two Randy Savage hung out with us for the whole four hours plus after the show. He just hung out with us. Yeah, um, and he was so cool. Super cool the whole time. Didn't have to. He was, yeah, he was badass. I think uh, he wanted to see what was going to happen next. <laughs> yeah, Macho Man was great. He should be on my list because of that. I forgot about him hanging out with us. Oh, yeah, um, Rudd. Oh, my God. I mean, he was in there for the strippers and everything. We had the... Why all of it? All of it. My, uh, macho man. He was he was in my bubbling under. Um, I I wasn't into wrestling when The Rock was doing his thing. Nah, I I mean sure he's great, but I, I that was late later. This is all. I mean, what what era Correct. are we talking with all this shit, Rod? I don't even know. It's like late eighties, maybe mid eighties. Yeah, you're the talking late eighties, early nineties. I mean, these guys, some of these guys, you know, wrestled forever and ever and ever. They they stayed in right. there. These <clears> guys <throat> stay at the party a long, long time. Um. You know, I wanted to say how awesome he is. Like John Cena has been in the studio with us before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he's poised to become the next big star, like with The Rock. I think he has that quality. Um, you know, he does a lot of acting now. He seems to be like this go-to on Good Morning America kind of stuff. He seems to be a really, really likable guy. And I can tell you that he is fucking just as awesome as you would think he is. I've met him twice now. Um, and him in the studio just what an awesome guy, but it just, it, I, I, that was our, I was already out of wrestling at that time. So my list is going to be old as shit. Like Jason, uh, except for one, except for one. Um, and he's by today's wrestling standards, he's an old guy, but he's not as old, old as mine. Uh, here we go in at number five, Jimmy Superfly Sanuka off the top rope. 
He could fly, couldn't he? He could literally fly. Is, am I the only one that thinks that? Like, it felt like he was in the air forever, man. That move, he looked crazy when he was doing it. He was a little crazy. Mm. Um, I remember Paul Orndorff giving him pile drivers on the cement floor and did it like three times in his neck, the neck brace and everything. I mean, that was when I was kind of believing that stuff was real. I mean, um, I, I'll talk. There's another he has another moment with the wrestler that's coming up on my list. And I don't want to say who that is, but uh superfly snooker. Uh, he was on the air over the phone and it was, he was old. I, I don't know who's alive and who's not, but he he's was not super old. He's not. And, and we started the, the brother count, but it's not brother. It's Oh, brother. It was brother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We started a brud account of how many times he was saying it. And then I had to hit the bell as I'm talking, I'm trying to interview this guy. And it's like, well, brudda ding. Well, you know, brudda ding. <laughs> Everything was brudda. Um, and he was a childhood hero of mine. He's my number five favorite wrestler of all time. Uh, he really was awesome. And just what, what a fucking physique on that guy. Yeah. You know, some of those guys back when we were young, a lot of a lot of those dudes were pretty doughy, you know. George, George were, the Animal Steel. <laughs> correct. I mean, doughy, hairy, you name it. I mean, you got a weird list here. Um, the <laughs> Superfly was yeah, fucking dude. put together, right? Yeah, he was in good shape. He was one of the few guys that cared. It looked like. All right, Jimmy Superfly Snooker in at five. In at number four, Andre the Giant. The reason we're doing this list, Andre the Giant. After watching the documentary, I learned so much about him. He was on loan to all these different wrestling leagues. Vince McMahon hadn't unified the country yet. So there's all these different leagues. There's the Mid-Atlantic League. And then there was the, 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 the Canadian League that you and I used to watch. We used mm -hmm. to watch Maple Leaf Wrestling. And it, it took McMahon to unify everybody. And it's like, okay, we're going to have one big league now. And I know there's other smaller ones out there. But every region had their own. And Andre would go in and wrestle for six weeks and then go to the next one and wrestle for six weeks. So back when I'm watching wrestling, Andre, you know, I, of course you don't know any of this when you're a little kid, but I just remember that when it was mean Gene Okerlund or whoever's doing the interview, you would see a guy standing there and you would see a hand on the shoulder. And that's how you knew Andre was in town. So you see the hand and then they back up and then they pan, you know, how they over dramatize everything. They're backing up the camera and then fucking Andre the giant. And you knew you had him for a couple of weeks that he, he just knew like he would just, and then he would vanish. Yeah. He never really fought for a belt. Of course, this guy could have had every belt. So I, they couldn't keep him around because he just would have won. You couldn't, he couldn't lose. So the only thing you could do was, have him wrestle for a month, have him on TV every weekend, and then move him to the next location. But seeing the, it was the same thing every, that this massive fucking huge hand. And then we just lost our minds that Andre the Giant, seven foot four, 540 pounds. And they used to bring out these little bitches, like, like they see me walking by and throw a t-shirt on me and go here, go, go fight Andre the Giant a lot of time. And he would just pick you up like a rag doll, throw you yeah, around and slam in the ground. It's like, okay. But think was... about that. That's why he didn't stick around. He would have had every belt there was. Yeah. He never lost. Yeah, it would have been weird. <laughs> he never lost, but I, we never picked up on that when we were kids. We just, no. he would just vanish. Well, this you know, guy's he, got a chance. He's got a he chance. <laughs> but there was no internet. And then it's just like, you went a fucking year without seeing Andre the Giant. Right. Until he rolled around again. And he, then he was there for five weeks. Yeah. Um, so Andre the Giant in at number four. In at number three. Rowdy, Roddy, Piper. Yeah. Come yeah. on, dude. So nobody, well, my number one, my number one was the greatest guy ever on the microphone. The number two guy on the microphone, and a lot of people think that The Rock did the best mic work. Um, Rowdy, Roddy, Piper was the best, the second best guy on the microphone. Oh, yeah. His interviews, his craziness, the stuff that spewed from him, everything about him, he was awesome. He was the first bad guy that I liked. He was always a bad guy. I don't think, I don't know if he was ever a good guy. You and you know, didn't want him to be a good guy. 
what's weird is I, I don't remember him wrestling very much, but I remember him talking all the time. I, I don't ever remember <laughs> seeing him wrestle. It was weird. Yeah, the kilt, the everything, man. He was awesome. I loved him. I never got a chance to to meet him, interview, talk to him, nothing. And uh, he absolutely is one of my all-time favorites. I put him down at number three. He used to do this segment called uh, Rowdy Roddy, uh, Piper's Corner or something. And it was like he had his own little interview show, you know, like he's Johnny Carson. Right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. it's Piper's Corner, and then he's trying to interview guys, and he's just starting shit with them the whole time. But he had Jimmy Superfly Snooker on, and he grabbed a coconut and hit Superfly Snooker in the head. And then all of a sudden, Snooker goes through the set and everything. I asked Snooker about that. Well, brother. And I said, dude, the coconut. Did they start it a little bit, maybe, you know, because this coconut cracked and then there's blood everywhere. I'll tell you what, brother, nobody started nothing on that. He swore to me, brother, that, 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 brother, he swore to me that that coconut was not started in any way. Now, I don't know, but the coconut was smashed on his head and you know how hard a coconut is. Yeah. That's concussion. That's brain damage type of thing. Yeah. Only, only Jimmy Superfly Snooker died of dementia. <laughs> so he probably he might have taken a few thumps over the years. Yeah, maybe the coconut to the skull is not the best thing. Yeah, Piper's Piper's Pit. Piper's Pit. Piper's That's what it Pit. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was the best trash talker ever. But he's in at number three. In at number two is my newest guy, who by our wrestling buddies that listen to this, they're gonna say this guy's an old timer, but he's the only guy from when I wasn't into wrestling, that he transcended the whole thing. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Oh, uh, yeah. Stone Cold Steve Austin. I'm not really watching wrestling, but you couldn't not know who that was. The Austin 316 was everywhere. And he was this anti-hero. And when I'm talking about Rowdy Roddy Piper, there was such a line in the sand. You were either a good guy or a bad guy. And he really kind of blurred the lines. And I don't know if he was the first, because I'm not an expert at this, but he seemed to be one of these guys that just fucking did whatever he wanted. He hated Vince McMahon. He didn't tell you to, you know, eat your vegetables, you know, vitamins, vitamins. He didn't do any of that. He drank beer. He flicked <laughs> off people. He's given the middle finger. And he just seemed like he was just badass lone wolf guy. And he just, he used different language. The way that he trash talked, he looked cool as shit. He had the leather and that entrance music with the crash and then that music coming out. I mean, that, he's my number two guy. And I didn't really even watch a whole lot of them. Mm -hmm. But he's awesome, great documentary. All right, I'll check it and out. And that's another guy that, I know he's done a bunch of movies. I, I, I don't know, this guy, in the documentary, dude, he broke his neck, but he's supposed to win the match and he still had to keep performing. He broke his fucking neck and still found a way to get on the guy, lay on top of him and pin him. He couldn't, he had, he lost like he was hit paralysis on half of his body in the yeah. ring and he still kept the bit going. Jeez. Did, there's no, there's no, <laughs> Hey, hang on a second, guys. We're breaking down the wall here. These are no longer actors. We need to get him out of the ring. No, he wouldn't allow it. He still got out of there. They dragged him out, and then he went to the emergency room. Jesus. Insane. That's insane. Uh, he's my number two. My number one is Ric Flair. He's, yeah. the, he's, the, he's the most badass dude of them all. I know that he stole his the robes and all of that stuff. I think Buddy Rogers probably back in the day is credited with that. But for me, Ric Flair, long blonde hair, the robes with the fur and the sequins and everything. Fucking nature boy. Woo! There's He's the goat. He's the, He was the greatest, slickest talker of them all. I mm -hmm. think Rowdy Roddy Piper was the best trash talker. But Ric Flair, I, that shit still holds up today. And I know people still watch Ric Flair. And wheeling, dealing, girlfriend stealing, limousine riding, that whole thing. He, he was the best. He was the best. He was the fucking greatest of all time. So much so that ESPN 30 for 30 only did one wrestler profile and it's on him. It's on him. And it's great. I was digging up 
because I can, it all just started coming back to me once we started, oh, I started diving into this wrestling thing. And I was like, okay, I remember the figure four, which you talked about a minute ago. And I was like, well, who used to do that all the time? Who was the guy that once he threw, once, cause he would like stand up and look and grab your leg when the guy was kind of knocked out and he would yeah. grab the leg and start turning. Would that, was that was Ric Flair, wasn't it? Wasn't the figure did, four his he, thing? Yeah, he did the figure four. And God, yeah. damn, if I didn't try that on my brother and he was screaming at the top of his lungs, that figure four really works. But I, that was, I'm a little kid and Ric Flair had that long mane of like blonde, almost white at times hair. And I remember matches where just it's full of blood. Ugh. His whole hair is just full of blood. He's hanging upside down. And that Russian guy, Ivan Koloff, oh, yeah, in, a, yeah, yeah. In, a, in a cage match, is just raking his fucking head back and forth on the fence and then hangs him upside down. And he's just bleeding. His blonde hair is just full. I mean, that dude, nobody bled more than Ric Flair. He was you know? always, you're right. He was always a bloody shit mess. He was always bloody. And when somebody started bleeding, you just lost your mind. Like, holy shit. Did you Finally. see? Did you see? We just all talked about Ric Flair, um, the nature boy. And he's still around. And he's still around. Um, yeah, I know. He still does shit once in a while. Doesn't wrestle, but he's fucking old. Yeah, he's old, man. He really is old, and his body is just beat up. But watch that 30 for 30 on him. His daughter, Charlotte Flair, was in studio with us. Gorgeous, tall, fucking in ridiculous shape, and, you know, just awesome. Awesome. I mean, just talking about – talking with her – when the, when the mics were off talking and just telling her, I go, look, your dad's my favorite wrestler of all time. I know you hear this from everybody. She goes, I do, but I enjoy it. She goes, I really don't mind people telling me that my dad is their favorite wrestler. And I said, okay, cool. I'm just another one that I'm just telling you, I don't really watch, but you know, I, I'm sure you're great, but your fucking dad was the shit. She goes, I know he is, he is the shit. So wow. she handled it. She handled it well, because I'm sure she's heard that a million times. Did you see the movie, since we're talking about wrestling, did you see the movie called Fighting With My Family? It's about uh, this female wrestler, and she's British. And this is, this is probably like the early 2000s when she was wrestling. It's kind of a, a, it's not a documentary, but it's based on this chick. And it shows what she had to go through, like her and her brother wrestling in like this small little town. And then they get discovered. Kind of. I, I know I didn't see it, but the movie does sound familiar. It's fucking funny. It's good. And I don't even, you know, like I said, I'm not into wrestling, but I enjoyed the movie. And it shows you kind of what they go through nowadays, all the amount of training and everything, how brutal it is. Vince Vaughn's in it, The Rock's in it. Um, it's funny. It's a pretty good movie. Fighting, uh, fighting with the family. Yeah, Fighting with the Family is what it's called. It was pretty good. I watched it a couple of years ago. It's on Netflix, I believe. Check it out if you're a wrestling fan. It's actually a pretty okay. cool story. Um, yeah, this whole wrestling thing, man. And it's, what's funny is like, my brother's going to listen to this and, and I'll come over to his place later this week and he'll be like, dude, what the fuck? You forgot about this guy. Oh, you I forgot can't about believe- this guy. You forgot, you forgot about, about Ricky this Steamboat. guy. <laughs> Ricky Steamboat was one of my favorites. Right. And I never understood like, like, and, and again, I wasn't super fan. So, it, you know, yeah, like, like you had the, the heavyweight or the big champion, the world champion, but then you had like this weird intercontinental champion i could i'm like well why does an intercontinental champion guy fight the heavyweight champion we have a world grand champion and just wouldn't work that way you know i never understood what the i don't think they ever really explained what the intercontinental champion meant i think it's just another belt i I, you know i i I, I understood what the tag team belt was made sense Um, so there was the there was the i think there was only when i was watching there was three belts there was the intercontinental belt there was this guy tito something Tito, he's a Hispanic I'm guy. Not even going to try. Inter- <laughs> Tito. <laughs> Don't even start typing in Tito into T-I-T-O Google because you're going to get 9,000. And there's dudes, there's dudes listening right now screaming the name. They're, they're just screaming it. And I can't hear them. I can't hear them. They're screaming it. They're like, dude, type faster. There was, uh, who did I write down? I had another guy. You said Ricky Steamboat, right? Earlier? I did. Ricky Steamboat was awesome. Wasn't there a guy like San Marco or is that Tito, Tito Santana. Santana? Tito Santana was the intercontinental champion forever when I was a kid. 
Tito Santana. Well, there you go. See? Um, All right. Ricky Steamboat. You know who we missed out on who I thought was a really good character? Uh, Ultimate Warrior. He was a little bit later. Yeah, and he and was kind of like that the guy who was like kind of supposed to take the ball and run with it after Hulk Hogan, but he just wasn't that dynamic he's really of really crazy, I think. Because yeah. I think he's absolutely really nuts. But Ultimate Warrior had great rock hair. He was awesome. I mean, Jake the Snake, I always loved him. Fuck that guy. Um, no, no, no. He had a snake, dude. Why, why would you bring a snake into the ring? I would watch it. I would turn this TV off as soon as he'd show up. I'm like, nope, fuck that guy. I don't Jake like snakes. The snake. That like snake, him. that snake bit your boy, Macho Man. And they, I mean, he, there's a match where he bit into Macho Man's arm. I'm sure the fangs were taken off, but uh, Brett the Hitman Hart, Canadian. Um, I, there you were know, so Hulk many. Hogan, Macho Man, The Rock. I wrote down all of that stuff. Yeah. It's, but once, once I, you know, I started realizing this is really fucking fake. <laughs> but I remember going to my buddy's houses and we'd all watch it together on Saturdays. You know, you'd be hanging out, playing video games, and all of a sudden wrestling came on. And I remember it vividly. I'm at my buddy's, my buddy Paul's house and they were, were watching wrestling. And then it was like, it was setting up for WrestleMania. And it was going to be like the one in Detroit. I don't know if it was the first one or which one it was, but. Right. And they were just losing their shit. Oh my God, WrestleMania. And, but I think it was pay-per-view back then or some shit. And they're all like trying to figure out, Ma, can we get pay-per-view for the wrestling? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not. There's no way I'm going to approach that question with my mom to get paper. I don't even know we had cable at the time. <laughs> Dude, I, all these guys, and, and I was doing the research, like Superfly Snooka, like dementia. And apparently he was being charged for killing his girlfriend back in like 1983. Randy yes. Macho Man Savage there, died. There was that? There was something. Oh, no. These, these, these are guys, horrific. These are horrific deaths, man, that and, these guys have... They, I mean, it's very tragic. There's a lot of tragedy that follows around these wrestlers. Because they're, you know, what you don't realize is we saw them in the WWF, and a lot of these guys are, like you said, working these circuits. You know, the the Gulf Coast had a huge circuit. That's where, like, uh, what's the guy that carried the hacksaw, Jim? Hacksaw uh, Jim Duggan. I remember the, when they pulled. Oh no, that was another guy. The junkyard right, dog. Mm -hmm, JYD. JYD. <laughs> A lot of those guys were kind of from the, the South. So, you know, you, you're, you're wrestling almost on a, on a every other night basis or at least once a week. So you're getting your brains bashed in and then you finally make it to TV. You're still getting your bra brains bashed in. And if you only last on TV for a couple of years, you go back to the circuit and you get your brains bashed in. So brother, that's why you talk like that. <laughs> you know, it is, it's a shit life. It looks like it looks cool on TV, but unless you're like the rock, it's pretty much shitty for everybody. Yeah, that's, that's like a lot of stuff. It, you know, everything is more glam. Everything is less glamorous than you think. That's for sure. But The Wrestler, the movie that you were talking about with Mickey Rourke. Mickey Rourke? Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, you know, I, that was so believable to me that, you know, he fucked up his, hadn't seen his kid in forever. You know, he's got an action figure of himself, all of this stuff, and he's living in a van, you know, yep. with... You know, not doesn't have two nickels to rub together, and he's a fuck up, Huge. and he's a fuck up. He he and, did get to hit uh, Marissa T Tomei though. I believe that was okay. I didn't mind that part. She was she was still hot. You know, Spider Man's mom or aunt, whatever. Marissa Tomei looked amazing in that movie. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, All right, dude. Let's do. Let's wrap this up, man. What do you have for a final thought today? Um, you know, you you brought up something interesting, Rod, just a second ago. This wasn't going to be my final thought, but I just want to bring it up because. Sure. You know, obviously, when Sean Payton retired, announced his retirement from coaching the Saints the other day, you know, the big thing is like, well, why, man? He's successful. He's making millions of dollars. He's got all this. He's got the world at his, you know, feet. And then you just said the appearance of everything looks great. <laughs> and I was trying to explain to my son. I go, I said, well, yeah, you're right. He's rich. He's got millions of dollars, celebrity endorsements. He can pretty much write his own ticket for the rest of his life as far as being on TV or writing books or coaching again he can do whatever he wants okay yeah you're right so but think about what you got to give up to be that guy i go those dudes sleep in their offices they're working 16 17 hours a day for like yeah. nine ten months out of the year what are they giving up divorces you don't see your kids the dude hasn't seen his kids in 10 years or 15 years hardly you know you're giving up so much for your passion you're, you're a coach you're not doing that because it's something cool to do you 
you wake up and you breathe it, you live it constantly. It's like us with radio, you know, you, you just eat that shit up. It's something you have to do, you know, but there's sacrifices for someone at that level, the sacrifice that guys made all these years. Yeah. I know millions of dollars sounds nice, but eh, you know, there's personal issues that go along with that. And I'm sure he's, the poor guys had quite a few. So like you said, with the wrestling, any of these people you see, that's like they're actors or billionaires or whatever the thing is, there's a flip side to that coin, you know, and the wrestlers, they all ended up, you know, brains or scrambled eggs brother uh that's not really a final thought rod but uh that's kind of what i was thinking about when you said that i was like yeah to bring it all full circle final thought for you uh happy birthday eddie van halen the <sighs> right there you got that beautiful picture right behind you and uh still just uh another is one of those guys that just it hit me and uh his birthday um would have been 66 years old today as we're recording this. I kind of wondered if we would have some kind of, uh, I knew what the answer was. Okay. He's been gone almost a year. I kind of wondered maybe would there be some sort of a tribute to Eddie? Would there be a show? Would there be something like we saw with Chris Cornell tribute? They all get together. Boom. All I really wanted. I mean, it would have been great. Tom Morello shows up and Slash and all these people, they all come up there and they play Van Halen songs and it would have been awesome. All I wanted to see was Sammy, you know, Michael Anthony, and I really, I wanted Alex on drums. I, you know, David Lee Roth, I didn't even care. You know, of course you got to get David involved. The fact that that band is so fucking dysfunctional and they can't even, in the dude's death, they can't even get on the same page. I just read something uh, that Sammy was talking about. Alex has not returned his call. Michael's reached out to him. He can't, doesn't want to be bothered. Now, okay, I get it. There's got to be a grieving time. But nobody has seen Alex Van Halen. He, people have reached out to him, and he's not returning any calls. Sammy has not talked to Alex since Eddie passed away. Not hmm. to, hey, come down and jam. It's just, hey, so sorry you about your brother. Right. I know we had our problems, but I loved him. And Sammy is so awesome about that time period in Van Halen. He said, we had our problems, but that was like one of the greatest times of my life. And nothing from Alex. Weird. Nothing because, at all. Because Roth says that he talks to him all the time. Those fucking Van Halens, man, they're the weirdest dudes ever. They They're the weirdest weird. dudes ever. Do you believe Roth? No, I don't know. He, he no. talks to him all the time. I don't know. I don't know what to believe. I don't believe know that anymore. I believe Roth. I don't, I don't know. And you know, it's funny because I, I, I played a bunch of Van Halen songs today on my noon hour in tribute to Eddie's birthday today. And as I'm going through it all, it like, it, it like, it was weird because when he died, it was, you know, obviously it was terrible. But you knew, you know, in the back of your head, I was like, well, he's been sick. They're never going to tour again. That kind of sucks. So I kind of felt it coming a little bit, but, but they still were a shock. going to tour again. They I mean, were the Wolfgang stuff that came out afterwards. You're like, fuck. Right. That and he, been awesome. he, he sold his dad on it and both singers. God yeah. damn it. But it's like, you know, when I was go putting it all together today to do some stuff and talk about it, I was like, it kind of hit me hard again today. It was weird. I was like, God damn it. He's gone. Eddie freaking Van Halen is gone because every picture is like he's got that goofy grin on him on his face and he's just cool. It looks like he's having the time of his life every single day. And, you, and it just kind of hit me again like, shit, dude's gone. You know, and it was just, you know, and then that happens obviously with death. You're just, you, you, you have those relived moments like, I can't believe it. You know, and it was a weird thing today. I was just like, shit. But why no fucking Van Halen tribute? Why no... Why has there been nothing? Because they won't allow it. Because they can't even contact people to see if we're allowed, if they're allowed to do it. I I think that Wolfgang, if he wants to do it, he could he could pull it off because he he pulls the strings. You know, he he yeah, was the one who was pulling it there. I think if he wanted to do it, it would happen. I just think maybe he's not ready yet. You know, um, he posted a picture of him when he was a little kid and his dad Eddie sitting on some steps, just a family picture. You could tell it was a quick snapshot. And just happy birthday. It's like, oh, you know, it, it hits you again. And you're like, Jesus, good Lord. I didn't see it. I didn't. I, I, it's just, I, I kind of went through the whole day until right now talking, not thinking about Eddie and his birthday today, but uh, it's just a shame. I mean, you can't make people do things. You know, Van Halen could have given us so much more music. 
They could have done so much more. This is just me from my completely shouldn't even have an opinion on it. But what the fuck, man? You know, there should be so much more Van Halen. There should be so much more that we should have gotten. And we You're didn't, right. you know? I mean, it's you, frustrating. There were a lot of albums, but I guess, you know, you think about it from, from that side of things, and believe me, I wouldn't know because I don't have that kind of talent, but you have standards. And maybe everything else that they did, they felt wasn't, up to their standards so it takes a long time to make that type of music right. to be what it was and there's probably tons of shit you know they, they got the, the stories of the archives of all the shit over the 5150 studios that wolfgang's like yeah i may go through it someday but man there's a lot of shit to go through and do i really want to sit them. there you know I going asked. through that it's like oh my god who the hell wants to do that you know at the end of the day um yeah it's a, I was thinking, picture. it's a great picture of him and his dad i just looked it up on instagram it's awesome yeah, you know, I was thinking about it today too. Actually, it's funny. Is like, man, why did why did Van Halen not do more like soundtrack work? You know, scoring because they did so, they did a couple of songs for the movie Twister back in the day, and I'm like, those are some guys that could have. They were composers. They they could play a lot of different instruments. Why not use that to do movies and do other shit? I, I just don't think they ever. I don't know. I don't know what was going on, man. It would be weird yeah. to like see behind the curtain there. Like, why not? Why not do a bunch of shit? They just didn't seem to want to, I guess. And we're still don't have, I, again, I, they don't owe me anything, but mm, no. you'd think you'd want to do some sort of a, I mean, every guitar player in the world would be begging to come in and play and get up on stage as a tribute to the guy that was such an inspiration to them. Can you imagine what a guitar, just a one night fucking guitar follies just one after another, after another guitar gods, just everybody up there on that stage doing stuff. It would be amazing, you know, and it would be all for Eddie. And, you know, they don't seem to care about that. The family doesn't seem to care about that. Wolfie, yeah, he's working on his own career. I get it, but the bro, every, it, you know, they just don't seem to care about that stuff because yeah. they knew that his dad wouldn't want it, I guess. I mean, Eddie wouldn't want a bunch of musicians making a fuss about him. Fuck, I want people to make a fuss about him. Even if it's, it's just year, like, you know, it's almost been a year. He's gone. Like, like get a couple guys, get, get guys that Wolfie picks, you know, don't just get, you know, I don't need to see the guitar player from poison up there, but you know, get not to shit on poison again. Cause we seem to do that every podcast, but I thought we were running out of time. So I better, um, you know, get, get slash, get, get, get people that Eddie knew or liked or was influenced, you know, like get, get some of these guys that, you know, who, Everybody was fucking influenced by Eddie Van Halen. You, it would be every guitar player out there. But not know? everybody be, belongs it, up there, you know? You're right. That's you're the right. thing, you know? I mean, Certainly and then CC DeVille. That's who I was trying to think of, and I couldn't think of it because I didn't give a shit. <laughs> that's why. Um, yeah, I guess it's weird because, you know, for a singer, you can just go out and grab a bunch of singers and everybody can sing the song. You know, it's it, with Eddie Van Halen, you know, it's guitar player. It's kind of different. It's a different thing. Well, at this point, everybody can play all those songs. That's but true. It, it's not the point. It's just the point of getting everybody together and celebrating him. And he's certainly worthy of it. Uh, and I think people would fly in from all over the world for it to Shit, get up on yeah. that stage. But just the family doesn't seem to be interested in it because I, I be, because of reasons. I'll leave it at that because of reasons. I just, I wish I knew what those were, but your last name's Van Halen. You're a fucking don't care about shit that we care about. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're not, they're not fans. We're just fans and we want more and more and more. And they're just not, you know, they're on the creative side of things. And they're that's, like, you know, I'll get it to you when I get it to you. I mean, that's that. That's what you got to look at it though, man. You know what? I gave you all this stuff. I gave you all this work and that's not enough. Fuck you. Yeah. You know what I mean? At the end of the day, that's the way you have to look at it too. And as fans, you want more and you want more. Oh, new albums coming up. Oh my God, finally, new album, new music, new this, new that. And it's like, we're just this hungry machine that can, you know, you can only feed it so much, you know? And those guys, I don't know. I don't, there's a lot of moving parts in that band that are fucked up. Who knows if Roth can even sing anymore? You know, Sammy still can, you know, but, but there's know those Roth two. Can't sing. Roth those cannot two, sing. I mean, you got so many egos and so much bullshit in the room. That's just a mess. So I don't know. It'd be nice to have him. I don't know how it happens. You know, I really don't. Uh, well, I didn't mean my final thought to be that long, but that was my final thought. Happy birthday to uh, Edward Van Halen. 
Well, Rod, the uh, the leaving a, a phrase or a word at the end of each podcast so we can check our work uh, to uh, to to see if who listens all the way to the end. Which today I don't think it's going to be anyone. But I thought I would throw one in the ring, and because we talked about it earlier, I want you, if you're still listening at this point, to write down "check the oil." The word of the week is "check the oil." That's a phrase. Sorry, <laughs> check the oil. Put "check the oil" down in the the YouTube comments. Um, look, we're doing pretty good. You know, we're getting, we continue to grow every week. So we get more listeners all the time, but we really want to grow our YouTube channel a little bit more. We've, we've got a lot of subscribers. We want more. If we get more, we can do more things. That's how this works. So please smash that subscribe uh, button. Leave your comments. We love the comments. I know Rod, you read them, you comment, I'll read them. And, 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 and we love the comments, man. Give a shit about the wrestlers. Cause man, <laughs> we apparently didn't know much about wrestling that we tried. I mean, put the oil check down, but then also give us your top fives too. Give us your top fives. We're not going to shit on them. I mean, I will, but it's okay. You can shit on mine. Uh, give us your top fives on these different things though. And I, I think, I think you're going to see some people come out of the woodwork with these top five wrestling things. I, I, I this one might bring some different people to this podcast because this was not a music centric pod at all today. Very a, sports and phony sports. I, I think that um, it was a good to get us out of our comfort zone because we can sit here and talk music and radio all day long for the next hundred years. No big deal. But we kind of got, we're in a lane. We got out of our lane a little bit, a little bit, not far, not far. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't go way out. We went out of our lane just a little bit. You know, I, I, talking sports, I can only talk about it as being a fan. I'm not going to give you X's and O's and all that shit. I'll tell you what I think, but it doesn't fucking matter. What I think, I don't know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. Well, check out our social media pages at Play Pants Pod. Uh, tell your friends about it. Say, hey, when you're bored, listen to this. It's great. It's fun. It's completely asinine, and you'll never learn anything from it. True that. Word. True that. Thank you, guys. Later. Let's go. It's put on Play Pants. Find us wherever you listen to podcasts. See us on our YouTube channel. And follow our social media pages at Play Pants Pod.